Um, we're on record now, so uh, I will send hello, this. Hello, Realty One Group Turnkey Brokers. Yeah. So um, Craig and I just got back from Summit, which is the Realty One Group conference in Vegas. It was really fun. Um, if you're interested in going next year, let us know, and we can let you know how to get tickets and, and so on. And what uh, was the size of the group? I mean, was it thousands? Over, thousands? over 2,000. Yeah, it was 2,600 yeah. 20, plus. So basically, you just took over a hotel? It was MGM, and yeah, I mean, you couldn't That's walk hard. anywhere without seeing people wearing black and gold. It was pretty yeah. cool. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And the thing about Summit uh, is, you know, with the bring speakers that talk about the real estate industry, they talk about Realty One Group and what they're doing. Uh, so it is a good opportunity. Up. It's a good opportunity to go there, uh, enjoy Vegas uh, tax write off, at the same time, uh, you know, sharpen yourself up that way. One of the largest things that we feel that uh, Realty One Group uh, conference is good for is that. Uh, networking, you know, uh, there's major networking down there, believe it or not, you think, well, why do I need to network with people out of state? But when you come to referral fees, literally there was a guy wearing an A-board around his neck, and that's that's a little bit over the top, but, and then we'd come back to another session and there would be uh, flyers on the seat that, you know, say, please uh, pass me your referrals, and so in any event, it is a good networking uh, deal. We have already, we had a really one group turnkey, uh, have referral fees uh, for buyers. And yeah, last year we had changed. we had seven closings in, in our office uh, where, I mean, people people don't call us necessarily. They call, they look on our website and they pick an agent and they call them out. I'm not sure how they pick an agent, but we had quite a few closings where agents were picked. I think a lot of it is social media. That's just speculation. They'll look up our agents on our roster and look, look on social media see who's active and then they'll call them and so um it's it's a good way to get business going yeah going it, it depends things. who you are you know if you do know people out of state and so forth isaac does i think you know i'll tell you that there's no question we all know that isaac schaefer is beloved here at this company and does a great job but the bottom line is just talk to prince about uh you know the san diego connection he has he's lived in Coeur d'Alene, and you know by going there and networking with these other brokers you can get referrals that way. So Isaac's done a great job at that, but you have to really go there and make the connection. Um, it, it helps. You know, yeah, you can right. certainly it's a face with the name. And yeah, name. yeah. So that's that, and and so it's beneficial. Uh, and it's a write off. That, 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 <laughs> it's a write off. I talked about that when you stepped up, and uh, you know, just that's that's enough about the really one group summit. Ask more about it, as you said for tickets and so forth. Uh, we'll get back to Isaac here. We just wanted to again recognize that uh, Prince is here. Uh, Prince, go ahead and say your full name. Hello, my name is uh, Princeton McCarty. Uh, you can call me Prince or Princeton. I go by both. Um, and I'm a new broker here, just starting. Right on. All right. All right. So we got Kenny and Chaz and Isaac and Craig Tuttle here, and Isaac's got the floor. Yeah, we got. I think we got a lot of people afraid of the coronavirus, so it's a small group today. I mean, but I mean, anytime there's a convention like that, there's two things that I usually come away with from them with, and one is that there's some new thing that's going on that's cutting edge that everybody's just going to eventually get to when they figure it out. The other thing is that there, there, there's usually a speaker that it's so motivational that it just changes how you look at yourself and what you're doing. <clears throat> yep. Absolutely. That's, that's a lot of what I, I mean, I'm going to just kind of breeze over it. Um, really quick. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just texting someone who's coming telling them that we're in the conference room today. So keep so, yourself sharp on any kind of news. If it's not, you can't get to a convention. I think at the point we want to talk about here is there is a ton of podcasts out there. We're not association of realtor here at this company. Uh, and we all know why and the reasons, but the bottom line is that doesn't mean we don't appreciate the Association of Realtor uh, and what they do for us nationwide and locally in their lobbying. What I want to tell you is it's probably one of the best podcasts that I know of when you go on there. It's free to you. You can go on there and you can listen to the nation's economists for the NAR on there. Uh, you've got inspectors, you've got home stagers, you've got people from everywhere in the nation, you know, many Minneapolis and Florida and and New Jersey, and they're all talking. So do yourself a favor, whether it's go to a convention to keep yourself sharp. Uh, but daily, you can li listen to that podcast. There's Bigger Pockets, which is an investment podcast. There's tons of free coaching out there. Um, so those are good things. And of course, you're really one group resources that you have on your portal in that coaching. So keep yourself sharp. So yeah, I just want to talk about a few a few of my um, takeaways from Summit. Um, 
Chaz, like you said, there were one of the, one of the best parts is the um, motivational speakers and and um, the uh, the speakers who are in the industry and they're talking about some some new business that they're starting. And there's definitely some of that. That's awesome. But I kind of I wanted to take away because those are kind of hard to relate. I want to just take away some things that came from from Summit that I felt like were. Um, the biggest takeaways for me, I just felt like they were just little, little tidbits. So um, I'm going to start with this one. This is, this is a little bit of math. So if everyone wants to pull out a calculator, I thought this was awesome. This really, this really helped me with some, get some clarity on something. This was a speaker who was talking about, um, talking about the um, effort, putting effort into delegating and how delegating is like one of the hardest things to do. It's, it's so difficult to know when to, um, pay somebody else to do something when you can just do it yourself. But the way he explained this was, was really cool. So what I want you to do, you can keep your numbers to yourself or you can say it out loud, but um, come up with either your goal income for the year or if you want to say your past income from your best year or whatever you want to do. So let's, for this, for simple math, we're just going to say 12 closings, okay? So if it's 12 closings, at $8,000 net commission, that's $96,000, okay? So just pick what, however many closings you want, you, you would like to do this year. And if, you, if you're working part-time and, you and your goal is four this year, that's fine too. But type in what, however many closings you wanna do this year times your net commission. So let's say 12 times 8,000, that is 96,000. So now what you wanna do is you want to go divide it by 2,080, which is 40 hours a week times 52 weeks. Now, if you work 20 hours a week, then that's fine too. You can just do the math that way, but however many hours per week times 52 weeks. So in this case, I'm gonna say someone working 40 hours a week, that's 2,080 hours. So that right there says $46.15. That's how much you're worth per hour. That's simple, oversimplifying it, right? You can add, you can nitpick this all day, say, well, I'm gonna take a holiday here and there and things like that. But you can play around with this and find out what is your, what is your actual dollar per hour? And his point was taking that number, what do you think you can delegate? There's, um, there was someone who spoke about virtual assistants. You can hire virtual assistants for $8 an hour. And if you're interested in this, I can show you these websites where you can hire people to call leads for you. Seriously. You can hire people to send letters out for you. And we're talking like $8 an hour. It's crazy. Um, or design things for you. So in this case, this person who's, whose goal is 12 closings at $8,000 per closing, that's 96000 per year, he's worth $46.15 an hour. So the goal of this exercise is to see that number and go, what am I doing that I could hire someone a lot less for a lot less than that to do? And it's and, and I'm not saying so go out and, and post an ad on Indeed and hire an employee. Not at all. I'm just saying it was for me. It 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 was really eye opening. I mean, I'll tell you, for me, I was honestly thinking, man, I gotta hire someone to do laundry at my house. I'm serious because I probably spend. <laughs> I, I have an Airbnb in the in the house that I live in, um, and um, gosh, I probably spend four hours a week doing laundry. I mean, if I could hire someone $15 an hour to do that and I could focus on um, whether it's recruiting or my own business, how much more money could I make, right? So anyways, that was really eye-opening for me. I'm not sure if you'll find that as helpful, but I just thought that was a really, really cool exercise. Um, it's kind of- Yeah, it is. I mean, you used a number of 12 and that, and that talks about someone who might be their second year in the business, maybe they had a really good first year. Uh, but, you know, you certainly in this business, we all know that it's a snowball that builds as long as there's not any major dip in the real estate market. But it is very common and we've ran these numbers without that calculation, which I think the calculation is interesting. But if you say, well, $50 an hour and then you can go to $100 an hour and then you go to $150 an hour for a top producer. Those numbers are numbers that we have spoken about in this office many, many times. And that was just before, like four years ago about, you know, when we we're smaller and it's like. I could get TJ was doing the business back then. Now he's probably worth a hundred, a hundred and a quarter an hour. But back then it, it wasn't right. And I was up there at the higher level. So you're absolutely right. It is important to think that way. You know, the goofy things that, you know, 
stinking thinking, I call it, trip over a penny to get to a dime. Be careful, look to outsource. Isaac, you were talking about not only just whether it's your laundry, you, you've got these different services that'll go to grocery stores and pick up your groceries. Yeah, uh, sounds bougie, but seriously, I, I just, I started, it was on the airplane back, I started writing down things that I'm doing that I could hire someone for less than $25 an hour. I was like, that's half, you know, so less than $25 an hour. And I just started writing things out. I'm like, man, yeah. why am I going to the grocery store spending hours in line at Costco? Like when you can, there's seriously services where you can pay someone to do that. And it's like nominal cost. Right. It's and, kind of and crazy. Do you, do you like to shop? No, I hate right. it. So there's some people who like to shop. So we're not saying that because I'm a goofy guy. I like to go to Costco, okay? Yes, you don't, do. don't take my Costco. Right, right, not, not right at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 Traditionally, yeah. 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 Take so, an hour or so, walk through each shelf. It's there. <laughs> not anymore. Right. There's nothing on the shelf. So right, it's right. It's crazy. So anyways. Anyways, I thought it was interesting. Something that just popped in my head. This could also be a really good um, way of deciding when you when you consider using a transaction coordinator, right? If you're worth fifty dollars an hour and you realize that all the stuff the transaction coordinator does takes you eight to ten hours, that means let's say it takes you ten hours to do everything that Sarah's transaction coordinator does. That means it's costing you five hundred dollars to do it yourself, whereas the cost of cost of hiring a transaction coordinator is three hundred dollars. Now that sounds self serving because you know. <laughs> But there's, but there's there's a lot of sense to that right? part of it, though. right? But if you're but if you're doing you know less transactions, you're like, well, I'm only worth twenty five dollars an hour. You know, I could do the work myself. That's fine. You know, there is a point where it doesn't make sense, but find the point that it does make sense. And if you got three transactions going on and you're not focusing on your on planting more seeds, so that when these three transactions close, you're not dry, right? Because you're so focused on uploading trans uploading your files to SkySlope and you know following up and stuff. That's the time that you should really consider. Don't trip over a penny to get to a dime, as Craig says, and hire someone like a transaction coordinator. So anyways, I won't belabor that much more. I just thought that was really helpful. And so yeah, I wanted to share that. Um, this is less uh, less sexy, but um, the, uh, the nerdy legal side of me um, went to a class. They, they kind of split up into different groups sometimes, some classes for like agents, some classes for you know, people who are in luxury real estate, and then um, this one was was for owners and managers, and um, and it was the really one group lawyers, and they were talking about some recent lawsuits in California, and I just I, I won't belabor this, but um, this kind of blew me away. There's been a few lawsuits in California where um, people are suing based off of Fair Housing, the Fair Housing Act, which to me they started talking. I'm like, when I think of Fair Housing, I'm like. Okay, don't be sexist. Yeah. Don't be racist. Kind of a no-brainer, right? It's like, got it. I don't need, you don't need to go over this. I get it. So here's the story. Um, one of the stories. There's been a few lawsuits in California. And when it happens in California, it bleeds out, right? We're the left coast. So it happen, it, it'll happen, right? It'll happen. So <clears throat> there was um, somebody listed a home. Um, they were um, empty nesters at this point. Their family had moved out. And... Um, and so it's too big for them. They get multiple offers, or no, they get two offers, and one's from a family uh, and, uh, with three kids, and they included a letter with their offer that says, oh my gosh, we love your home. We can't wait to raise our kids in this home. We love the backyard, you know, all that stuff. Stuff that I'm raising my hand, I've, done, I've encouraged people to do before. And then they got an offer from, um, from a, um, from a same-sex um, couple who um, didn't include a didn't include a letter, and their offer was five thousand dollars more. The seller innocently, this is according to the lawyer who you know who didn't really have sides, but he knew he was representing the seller in this. The seller innocently said, "We're they thought they were doing a good thing, right? They said we're fine taking five thousand dollars less." Because we want this family to enjoy this house like our family enjoyed the house. It had nothing to do with the with the same sex couple not getting it, but they took it as it being a violation of fair housing. Like they chose them because they were straight versus them being homosexual, which according to the lawyer is not the case. According to them, it was totally innocent. But as far as the couple was concerned, might as well have been right. And so they actually won the lawsuit got pretty significant damages. Um, so, and that, it kind of blew me away because I've, I've definitely seen that. Um, I've definitely seen people take less money because they just absolutely fell in love with one of the buyers. And, um, and 
99.9% of the time, it comes from an innocent place, right? It's not someone being sexist or racist or anything like that. They're, they just liked one of the buyers and wanted to help out that buyer and didn't think about the fact that it could be misconstrued yeah. as being. And I want to interrupt really quickly is that, you know, this video and all that, you know, be careful. It's not whether it's innocent or not. It, you know, you could have a seller that may be on a, a minority side of a group uh, and, and they choose one of their sides. Bottom line is, is that we in the real estate industry are shocked by this because we go through this daily and see these letters and whatnot. And the reality is the subject is a hot matter in California. It's probably gonna come this way. And we, you just have to think about where you sit uh, as a broker representing the seller. And Isaac, what, what did you feel about that? Um, yeah, so that, that that is the next step because um, the funny part was lawyers were classic lawyers. They, we're, we're all, we are all kind of like, so what do we do? And they were like, well, what do you guys think? <laughs> and so it kind of became like a discussion in the room. We start, we start talking about it. There was um, one designated broker who said, well, I, I, I already have thought about this. And I tell them um, they cannot present a letter with an offer. Um, and then people pushed back on that right away. They said, you can't do that as part of an offer and you have to deliver an offer, which I, I would agree with. If it's embedded with your signature. If it's embedded with, yep. right. It's authenticated. So, okay. To back up the, the suit, did it, it's and obviously it's going to be a civil suit if it's not filed in federal court for some sort of civil rights correct right, right situation right it's going to be a civil suit did they did, and they're going to they're going to include everyone they're going to sue the seller and the broker and the and so on and so forth but who ended up paying because that seems like as a representative you know our job is to advise and then there you go it's right. up to you so when they make that decision right, right here regardless of advice right it's like our it's like well financially in your best interest is to take five grand more because everything's the same blah 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 blah. but you have this sentiment and it the decision is theirs exactly. how is that presented right. in the, exactly in the 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 so the how, does, how does the seller lose their right to sell to whoever they want to <clears throat> because it's and i'm not saying i'm not saying it's right or it's wrong i'm just saying the facts okay the idea is the seller you cannot prove that the seller chose buyer A versus buyer B simply because they like simply because their heart was touched by buyer A. You cannot prove that it wasn't um, bias or whatever. And I know that I know what pops in my head when I say that is, "Well, aren't you innocent until proven guilty?" Apparently not. Not so much as not when fair house. Not the seller court. write a letter that it's says only, it's I'm only a majority buyer A because they touched our heart. They tried, but but apparently the judge didn't agree. So okay. and, and we so don't you, have to you, you, you can see the heat of this. We yeah. don't have five people here. <laughs> Listen to his chit chat. So here's the reality. But it, but it does play on on how do you, how do you behave then in those well, particular right. situations? Let me, right? let me so talk what, about that really quick. What, what would you do, Isaac? Well, so what what it ultimately boiled down to is because that's exactly what I said. I spoke up and I said, okay, wait a second. It's not my decision. It's ultimately a seller's decision. The lawyers agreed. And I said, so ultimately, all you can do is properly advise them. CYA, right? Properly advise them in writing that they should accept the offer that is most lucrative to them. And what what I haven't done in the past that, that I would that I would do now, absolutely knowing this, is in writing I would say what by you accepting this offer, regardless of if it's if it's a homosexual couple against against it could be anything. Like like Craig said, it could be someone who's ten percent Native American. It could be anything, right? Regardless, say if you're choosing an offer that is clearly not the better offer, it very Financial well be better. I mean, you have to describe better, right? Well, I mean, that's financially, a legal uh, definition for contingencies. Yeah. Um, you know what type of financing, etc. I mean, if you have good reason, you know, like well, their offers VA, and this buyer who's less is high down conventional. That's reason enough for good. But we're but notably, I mean, we're all pretty good at comparing offers, right? You're pretty good at being like this offer is better than this offer, right? Bottom line, if they're picking an offer that is pretty clearly not equal or better, you should disclose to them that you do not advise them to do that. Your, jo- your job is to say, hey, I'm trying to protect you here. You can tell them this story. You should not do that because that could be misconstrued as a violation of fair housing. 
And it's that simple. And that's in writing. You send them an email. I Ultimately, it's a new form. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, 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 I always send yeah. a new form. <laughs> I worked in the restaurant business, and this was a good 13 years ago. And a young woman came in, and she was hired, and she was part of the staff, and she was a lovely woman, and she was friendly to everybody. And what she was doing was she had a boyfriend that was a lawyer. And she was going, she was setting them up for sexual harassment. And so she kept notes every day of all the things that occurred to her that were bad. And so one of the things she pointed to was uh, there was a poster in the liquor room that had a sexy girl and it made her feel bad. And then one of the agents said, girl, you need to get laid. And she transformed that into, you know, you need to have sex with me. And, and so she, presented her case and got $10,000 to go away because she was a predatory sexual harassment person. And it, it seems to me that this is headed towards that. Potentially. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to get into opinions. Sorry. I, I'm just saying that's that. And that gets into, um, you could say that and one, uh, somebody else could say, well, may, well, you're belittling how she felt. And I'm not saying, I'm not getting it. I'm just saying somebody else could say that and they could, 180 dis disagree with you, right? So I don't want to get into whether or not this is correct. That that's that's skipping along the lines of politics. Right, how do we which, protect ourselves? That's what I. Want. That's all I want to there, talk. There about. wasn't a clear answer down there, right? Well, so no, the clear answer was very very clearly. It, it if you are accepting an offer that you cannot clearly defend as being a better offer or at least equal, it. Could it, I mean it is a violation of fair housing to accept a lesser offer because you like the buyer more? Right. That's just. A, I that's would say there's not a clear clear answer of court findings. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that. Forms. Actually, I didn't. I, oh, I didn't know that that was actually against that. But me too, Ken. Ken. I, that's, that's, I, that's, that's new. That's new. That's right. What's that's What's scary. important here is you you buyer and your seller are doing things a lot of times you don't know as far as their decision making. So you're not. You're not in any harm at that point when you don't Ignorance know, but, but as soon as this thing comes over and comes across, then it puts you in a bad situation. Mm -hmm. What you could do is prior to offers coming in, you tell the seller, look, this is a thing that people are doing. They're sending pictures, they're doing this, they're doing that. Uh, sellers sometimes look people on Facebook. I, I just want you to know that I'm aware that people do that. I want you to know that when these offers come in, that this is really a big deal. You, you, it is. You, you can't tell me that you were thinking a certain way. Now, I'm in uh, factual knowledge of something, and, and, and I need you to be very careful about that. That being said, now let's let the raw offers roll in, and we'll deal with what, what we have. Hopefully, we don't have a tough situation. Can we ever talk off the record to our clients? Well, we're recording right now. No, well, I mean, yeah. to our clients. I mean, is that... Is that... Not, not, not if it's a material fact. So I mean, that's, that's, that's what you're looking for, right? right? Yeah, let's, facts. what's your question? That's what you're looking for, like material facts when it comes to the reason you might take a, a lower offer if it's your client, if it's your, um, if, you're, if it's your seller. Generally, that's what I would have said. Like, Ken, I, I would have been like, if if they aren't telling me that, that, that the reason they are accepting this offer is a violation of fair housing, right? They're just saying, oh, I just love these people. I met them at the open house and they were so great. I would say, it's totally fine. But after hearing this, no, I mean, regardless of their actual intentions in civil court in civil law, you're guilty. Even the topic of the letter with being a gay couple and then being, uh, you know, wanting to raise a family, you know, the, 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 yep. the details of that particular letter could have been weighed. Oh, well, why? Because you don't think we can have a family? or There's all kinds of ways you can go oh, with that, right. with that so particular let, situation. You know? and so we can move on here. I want to tell you something. <laughs> I said there's not a clear answer, and I said there is a clear answer. I think the, the clear answer they said is be careful to this. The reality is it's like the coronavirus. Trump comes out and starts saying stuff. He should say, we're going to consult the experts on this, right? I mean, it, we want to hear from the experts. I want to tell you that here at Realty One Group Turnkey, we have an opinion on what to do here. We're now more aware of this. And here in Washington, it's going to be different than California. And I want to consult with our attorney here. So we're going to get back to you a little bit more on this subject. Yeah. Right? Because if you're to tell me, I can't clearly, unless someone in this room could tell me that a, the seller can't choose, you know, one offer over the other for something, it's a gray area. Because it's the, there's not enough case law on this that I think it's been a good conversation. Right? And okay. we can do certain things. 
But we will tell you that we do spend time on other subjects like this. And we, yeah. and we consult our attorney. So I'm going to work on pol uh, an updated policies and procedures on this because, um, as I always say with policies and procedures, it, last thing I want to do is micromanage, but what's our, our job as a brokerage is to protect you. And so um, you're right, Craig, we will be talking to a lawyer, so this isn't a final answer. Yeah. But ultimately, same with everything else, especially things like this where it's not ultimately your decision. You can't say to them, no, you're forbidden from accepting that offer, right? Ultimately, how do you cover your ass? Sorry, excuse and my language. About, well, and that is disclose. Come, come to us and when you're in an uncomfortable situation, number one. Yep. But then disclose, disclose, disclose. So I'm speculating that, that the policies and procedures for this will be we'll have a letter all ready for you saying this is a letter that my brokerage requires someone to send. You can say it however you want, but and send it like that. And it'll be written by a lawyer explaining that accepting an offer that is, you know, not clearly equal or better than another offer is a violation of fair housing. And you're liable. Or it can be, uh, if it's a lawyer, yeah. yeah. Right. And so, so we're going to work, work on that. We're close to clarity. We'll get you a final answer coming up soon. Right? But at the same time, I think there, I, I, we're close to clarity, but there is clarity. And I think I just want to pause for one second and say this applies for everything. Um, you know, if in doubt, put it in writing. Don't, don't, you know, if in doubt, send them an email that says, you said this. I said, I, I explained to you this, and I just wanted to repeat that. Here, here's one quick example that has come up recently. Um, when I review files, I will often see um, a listing of our one of our brokers, um, and the Form 17 is missing a couple boxes. Like sometimes it's it's super innocent where it's like um, irrigation and it's they don't even click not not applicable. This is splitting hairs here, and I'm sorry for the tangent, but it's incomplete. But it's incomplete, and what in the law says you have to provide it a completed form 17 to the buyer, and if you do not, up to the very hour before closing, they can back out with no repercussions. Okay, so they get their earnest money. But but let me make it a little more. Yeah, they get their earnest money back. Let me make it a little more complicated though. We all know form 17, I can't get a form 17 from my from my seller and go, oh, they missed that box and check it, right? It also says right up there, this is only for the seller to fill out, right? Or power of attorney, but only for the seller or their power of attorney to fill out. And not for you to interpret exactly. and tell them. If you ever interpret stuff on a form 17, because let's be real, we all have an opinion about it. I always say, I want to be clear. If I was selling my own home and I was filling out this <laughs> disclosure, this is what I would do and how would I interpret it. I am not telling you how to fill this in. Boom. Yep. Clear. I've, I've heard Craig say that many times, and I think that distinction is important because we're really not supposed well, to. We, we are, <laughs> because let's be real. <laughs> they ask you a question on it, we want to give them an answer, and then just state that before the, because... The answer is you're being vague about your answer, you're not being specific about their home, right? You're saying, how I interpret that is this. It's your home. Right. Okay. But anyways, my point in saying that is, so let's say you were to say you wrote back because this is this actually happened this week. Somebody said, well, I told I told my seller that they should complete the form seventeen, and they and they just threw their hands in the air and they said, who cares? Right. And they said, what do I do? And I said, well, if I, what I would do is I'd write them an email and just say, hey, I just wanted to repeat our conversation. I told you to fill out the form seventeen. It's probably fine. Or sorry, don't say that. Just so you know, the the risk of not doing that is that the buyer could back out at any time. Done. Okay. Perfect. Send it. You're done. And then if they if they ever got mad at you and said, well, he didn't. Hey, come on back. How's it going, Marty? No, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyways, that was a total tangent, but that was a disclose, disclose, disclose in writing, in writing, in writing um, to cover yourself. So anyways, how's it going, Marty? Well, I was a little mixed up this morning. I'm sorry I'm late. Oh, no, no worries. Well, no worries. Glad you came. Oh, well, so thank you. we are on record. We're in the midst of this meeting, just uh, recapping some things we learned at the uh, conference. I just talked about uh, fair housing, and uh, the thing I want to tell you is about whatever the subject is that we're unsure because there's not a lot of clarity and there's a lot of types of issues. Number one, what do you do as a broker uh, when you're in a situation and you're not sure what to do, even if you're sitting at the uh, signing with them an enlisting appointment or a buyer, what what is the first thing we should do when we're not sure? Uh, reach out to your designated broker, or your ma managing broker at the office, and get advice. Right, um, that's what you do in a hot spot. If you've got a little bit more time, you got a day, a full day on your hands. 
Uh, number one is go look into the matrix, not matrix, but the Northwest MLS and their forms and just search in the search box. If you're looking for financing, type in financing. Search, search, search. There's always a form for something of your topic. And now, the form may not speak exactly to the topic, and you might find that two forms have it. We're going to probably advise when we get in those situations that we will go ahead and write up a clause for you that fits your situation. Uh, Isaac and I don't get into just writing ourselves, freehand writing. We know from all taking our tests, don't do that, right? Now, there are MLS forms that other brokerages from A to Z, when you go into the MLS, you'll find this. I'm not going to explain it, but they're there. When they, when if we, we're going to have a form here eventually. We've been working on it for years. Probably the bottom line, though, is that you've got to spend money on an attorney, get your form made into a template approved by the MLS, and then uploaded. Once it's uploaded, then everybody can use and see those forms. So, for instance, I talked to Justin Haig at the Northwest MLS about a situation, and he, and he says, you know, good, good point. That's not really in a specific form, but hey, go look at Caldwell Bankers and Homish. They have this, and John L. Scott Kent has this, and I think these two speak to it. And so we talked about it. He says, yeah. He says, I'd probably take that paragraph less this, this paragraph less that. You follow me? So there are ways that we're going to help you. Look yourself first so that you're not calling us up for something that's obvious that we've talked about in a meeting before, like simple things of 22A, Section 5, or something. And Get yourself at a point where we can talk and you've got the clear knowns out of the way and there's an unknown left and we we'll go, okay, let's find a piece to that puzzle, all right? If we can't get it done through that method and steps, we're gonna go then get an attorney ourselves to help you. That is rare. I, 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 can't, I can't even think of too many times that we've ever it's done that. But now that we have an in-house attorney here, um, it's been right. help, helpful to do that. So, so that's the... That's the recap on when right. you get into a situation where you're not sure what to do, whether it's a spare housing or something else. And then I just want, I think everyone knows this, but so this is the front page of Northwest MLS. You click on Express Forms up here, and you've got all the forms right here, right? You can do a simple Command F, or I think if you're on... Um, There's a search box right up at the top, right? That works too, but I find the search box kind of wide net and it gives yeah, you a yeah. ton. Okay. So I, I like to go Command F, or if you're on a PC, Control F, I think. And you can go um, well, can't see rental, the screen, but he's searching, and then for... it shows you everything, right? So that's that's a little that's hack. cool. I, yeah, that's I, what I, I do. do. But then, um, if there's ever a form that you have questions about, um, as you can see, you've got the form right here, and on the right side, you've got the manual. So in this case, there's if no there manual, manual, but yep. that's where it shows if there's a manual. And so if you're asking about I've actually never seen this form. Let's click on it. Green Building Information Supplement. There's a manual for it, which I would definitely need because I have no idea. Um, so anyways, this is, I'm not sure if you've seen a manual, but it really explains it. And then um, on top of explaining it, look at all that information. It looks like they've taken that from the class. No, what, no they the, took the it. The lawyers, the lawyers, the lawyers who wrote, wrote it. The form explained first. Right, and then if you have a question inside the form, so now it shows you the form, you can be like, wait, what was this again? You click on it and it takes you right back to a energy source and it explains it. It's really helpful. Yeah. So anyways, this so is a great way to educate yourself. go to the top yourself. of the MLS again where you found, searched it in the beginning and go to the very top. So the MLS can get a little bit confusing because there's a lot of tabs, but the bottom line is, is that under the forms, there are company forms. And we're going to have to go to... Internal forms, I think. Internal. No, maybe not. Statewide. That's where we were. Additional. Yeah, see, we have to search around, too. Here we go. The company... That's how I do the company form policy, but here's all the A to Z of all the <coughs> company forms. You open up one of those, and you might have one company that has 20 forms in there, or one form. So it's, it's endless. Uh, that's a, yeah, resource and, and that's a bucket of worms we're not saying you have to get into that as always we'll make you aware of it yeah yeah aren't aware of it yeah but as always if you if you're feeling i think the point craig was making um is if you're writing something by hand right typing in something because it's not in the form um unless it's an inspection addendum which even that can be scary right just don't hesitate to call if I don't have an answer we'll bring Craig in if Craig doesn't have an answer we'll bring the lawyer in right because we're here to you know help protect you guys and so um, I mean even Craig and I will sometimes just even even when we're doing a transaction we'll just call and say hey does this make sense 
you think this is covering us? Just the camaraderie sometimes and the um, just running it back and forth. Right. We could talk for hours about inspection response. Here's what I want you to know. Don't look for a form. Don't be afraid. Call us. Because the reality is, is you're going to be end up freehand writing. And the other thing that's happened is, is they won't allow us to attach the inspection report unless you're asking for additional time on your inspection, you have to attach it. But you're not attaching the entire report, otherwise you're violating your contract. Too complicated, we can talk about this later. Bottom line is, call us. Because, you know, you, you could ruin your transaction. And if you tell them to have a licensed bond or contractor do everything, all you have need for is electric, electrical, and the rest of the stuff is like, put this queen down and do this and do that. And now you're gonna be too far out of cost. In your 35, it says that the work is to be performed in a commercially uh, professional manner or something. That, what is, that's legal terms to say that it's, it can be done by the seller or the seller's nephew in a commercially uh, professional manner that meets what a judge would interpret that a contractor would do out there. So don't be so afraid that you're not ask, you don't ask for everything for a licensed bond contractor to do. You're going to probably kill your transaction, right? So bottom line is call us on when you're, you're stuck into a 35 because that's tough. That is a really tough area and you're not going to find just, you're not going to find clauses online. So if we find a form that's from another company, or it, since it's up there, I know that that's required for their particular firm members to use in their transactions, but can we use those? Yes. Okay. Yeah, you can. Because whatever it is, it's probably happened to somebody before and they've reacted by creating a form. Well, I know, I, I mean, I, I know there's a lot of forms on there that are just, you know, CYA stuff for certain companies. It's what they have perceived totally. that this is what we need for our records and blah, blah. So their agents Absolutely. are just required to use it. But if there is something that we feel, but even though it says somebody yeah. other, another company though, but yeah. we're still able to use that, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, say, I'd say right. 20%, I don't know what the, 20% of the forms probably have the same thing we have in our bundle of disclosures that we give out to people. Mm -hmm. You know, and you receive this lead-based paint, the right to get a home inspection, uh, FHA form 41 or whatever it is, and then you've got the mold disclosure and you know, the agency law pamphlet and all that. And we have our own that we give out and do that, but yes, about 20% of them have that general clause that you were just mentioning, Kenny. Yeah, that's a lot of what that is. Some are more simple, some are more detailed. Yeah. So we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna be able to get to everything, but I want to do. Um, so you guys probably no, that's okay. That's a tangent king over here. <laughs> I'm bad well, at it, it too. It's a, it is a big deal because in essence, to me, the whole thing is like re-educating people that have been in the business for a while because what you thought was okay before isn't necessarily okay now. Absolutely. Regardless of the, you know, the thing in California or the forms here or whatever, and now it's getting the word out to agents that you know what. Things are a little different, and you might want to like look into something that's even. I don't even know how you describe it. Now it's almost like relearning everything, right? Yeah. Because you're not sure what's okay and what's not okay anymore, or what can be perceived. Yeah, don't stay inside the box. Be an open thinker. Yeah. Um. So I'm not sure if you guys saw my email about um, Op City Leads. It's totally. It's an optional lead system. Um. It's cheap up front, but. Unfortunately, it's pretty expensive on the back end, so it's ten dollars a month to join, um, but it's thirty-five percent referral fee if it's over one hundred fifty thousand dollars sale price. So pretty much thirty-five percent. Yeah, exactly. So totally optional, but if you're interested, I'm going to show a couple videos on how it works. Um, it's not from what I from what I can see, it's not. Well, I got two two quick things to say. It's not one of those things that just send you leads and say, well, work it, go for it. They're pre-qualifying the leads, which I think is key. Um, and number two, to me, this is like when you sign up for a company that doesn't have a contract, which they don't either, you can cancel any time. They're so confident that they're, they only get paid when you close, essentially. $10 a month is pretty nominal. Um, and so that that speaks to me of the quality of the leads. If they're, you know, if they if they if the leads aren't good, then they're not getting closings, then they're not they wouldn't be in business, right? So, anyways, that's my speculation. I haven't used it yet, but anyways, I want to show a couple of videos, and then we'll wrap up. Hello, and thank you for partnering with Op City. Our goal is to make the process of working and converting online leads easier for you, so you can focus on what you do best: selling homes. So how does OpCity work? We pre-screen online real estate leads and introduce only the motivated home buyers and sellers to compatible agents in their area. 
we see these referrals from introduction to close and provide you with the tools and processes to be successful. Every day, we purchase thousands of real estate leads from different lead sources around the web. When a consumer expresses interest in a property by submitting their information online, our team reaches out to begin the screening process. On average, we contact consumers within four seconds of inquiry, making sure we beat out the competition. 78% of customers buy from the first person who reaches out to them, so speed to lead is critical to success. We do this from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. local time, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We're always on, so you don't have to be. Once we are on the phone with a customer, we collect key information that helps us determine their readiness to buy and their property preferences, such as price range, timeline, self-assessed credit level, and more, creating a full client profile. We do the work for you, so you only talk to clients who are ready to speak with an agent. For example, Op City Olivia is speaking with Charlie. Charlie is a potential home buyer who is looking for an urban condo in the 78660 zip code that is around $280,000 in the next two months. While Olivia and Charlie are speaking, we instantly generate a list of compatible agents for him and rank that list in order of best fit based on Charlie's needs and the agent's preferences and past performance with Op City. We then send those agents a notification with Charlie's basic information attached, so the agent can quickly assess if he is a referral they want to claim or skip. Agents may skip a lead for a variety of reasons, such as their availability, or if the desired location is outside of their coveraged area. The higher an agent's ranking, the sooner that agent will be notified about an available client, and the more time they will have to claim the lead. The first agent who claims the referral will receive a call from Op City Olivia, who will introduce that agent to Charlie via a three-way phone call. The consumer is on hold during this process, so when you claim a referral, be ready to receive a phone call right away. If we can't reach you, we'll connect that client to the next available agent. If you claim a referral but do not receive a phone call, most likely a higher-ranked agent won the lead. Don't let this discourage you. Just keep trying. The more you click and the faster you claim, the better you'll perform with Op City. Op City guides consumers throughout every stage of the buying and selling process. So we also connect our clients to loan officers, title companies, and other service providers throughout their journey. We take our partner introductions very seriously as they are vital to streamlining the client's experience. We ask that you allow our network partners an equal opportunity to earn the business while giving the client freedom to decide for themselves. We work hard to make sure the referrals we send you close. We take on the upfront cost and risk of purchasing leads so you don't have to invest in buying leads yourself. And we only get paid through a referral fee upon close. Referral fees vary by brokerage, so ask your broker if you have questions about your specific fee. We hope this video has helped you prepare to get started with Op City. You will be eligible to receive referrals as soon as the enrollment process is complete. We look forward to working together on many future closings. Okay, so I wanted to explain a couple things because they just kind of gloss over it. <clears throat> so agent ranking is a big deal. Like I was saying, they only get paid when it closes pretty much, right? So they send the lead out, like it said, to the agents who have a history of closing leads first. For them. For, what do you mean? There were agents that have closed leads that Op City sent them. Correct. Yeah. So when we start, quite frankly, we are going to be on the bottom of the totem pole. So you're going to get, so we might get lesser leads at first. And you don't have to accept them, right? You can just accept the ones that you're interested in. When you make your account, you say, okay, I'm only interested in leads in this area, right? You can draw, draw a circle around it or say these zip codes, et cetera. And then they won't send you ones, you know, it, they won't send you ones in Seattle if you're not interested in going to Seattle, right? And you can see one that says they're looking for a $150,000 home in North Coma and just ignore it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you can do that. But the point is the people who, um, the part, they, the other part they didn't mention there, the pe it's the people who um, accept the leads, follow up with the leads immediately, right? Are answering their call. And then they require you once a week to update the lead in their CRM. It's just an app and the update doesn't have to be a paragraph about just has to be spoke with them last here, right? They're waiting until May, something like that. So they see it, you're following up. 
and then you go up their list. And at first I was like, oh, that's interesting. But then I'm like, no, it totally makes sense because they're investing in these leads up front and, um, and they want to give it to the people who are actually following up on it. So they're, um, you know, if you're not, if you're not following up on these leads, why would they give you more leads, right? That's kind of the point. You can also pause it if you're going on vacation, you can just say, don't send me leads for a week, right? You can do things like that. So you're not, this isn't something that you commit to and then you're bound by it. And then, um, yeah, and last- your ranking or your status will probably lower. To no. a certain, there's an algorithm I'm sure that happens to where- So your ranking goes down, yeah. not if you're on pause. It goes down if you're not on pause and you're not accepting leads like day after day after okay. day. Um, so if you're re- they, they, when I was speaking to the rep, she was saying, we understand that there are times that you're really busy um, and we don't want your ranking to be hurt by you just not accept, not even looking at leads and not even opening the app. So just pause when you're like that, which I really like that, right? So you can be, you can, you can build a great reputation with Op City and then be like, I've got four deals pending and I'm showing two other buyers and I do not have time, just pause it. So anyways, I thought that was pretty, um, that was pretty neat too. So. Again, totally optional. I'll send these videos. Um, if you're interested, let me know. I know a few of you have already let me know, and um, you should have already gotten an email with the setup. Um, but if you haven't, if you haven't gotten an email and you're still interested, let me know, and I will send it to you. That's about it. We've got other things to talk about, but I think we're out of time, so um, we'll push it off to the next meeting. Um, we're thinking about adding a few Tuesday meetings, as always, totally optional. We'll record them. Um, but the idea would be like today, because we didn't have a lot of people, um, kind of more of a round table um, where we talk um, kind, of, kind of like how this first started off. We kind of talked about what's working, um, talk about, you know, some legal updates, things like that. And we, we discussed it as opposed to um, these office meetings where a lot of time it's me just talking at you guys. So anyways, um, I'll stay, stay tuned. I'll um, send more information on that. Um, the first one I for sure have in the schedule is, I want to say last week of Tuesday, um, I've got a really cool guest, not trying to sell you anything. He's actually a real estate coach and he's just trying to build a reputation. Um, I mean, I'm sure at the end he'll tell you how you could sign up to, to pay for him. But um, I spoke with, he was referred to me by another Realty One Group owner in Colorado and he said he was phenomenal, really helpful. And like the people who who went to the, um, went to the coaching, um, two of them are like, started he just they started using it right away and start you just saw direct results so anyways i'll send information on that too but um yeah excited for that so anyways thank you everyone for coming and i'm going to stop the recording now all right thank you Edward.